I saw something similar in, in the 79 and the 1980. You know, I mean, we had the my mys, you know, my my silver keeps going higher, my my silver keeps going higher, my my what's going on in the silver market. Oh my goodness, something's wrong with the silver market, what's happening? And we saw that to a lesser degree in the 2011 spike, that same situation, like what's going on, how come it keeps going up? You know, I mean, people talk about manipulation a lot, and I certainly have, I wrote about it in the Silver Manifesto. but. Um, Markets do move both ways, and whether it's being manipulated or not, you could argue one way or the other, but uh, the point being is that when you start to make a new high and everyone's holding, any buying pressure really will move the market. In the realm of commodities, few metals hold as much allure and complexity as silver. Its dual role as both an industrial metal and a store of value has made it a subject of fascination for investors and analysts alike. In a recent video, renowned silver expert David Morgan provided invaluable insights into the inner workings of the silver market, shedding light on the intricate relationships between miners, refiners, industrial users, and investors. Join us as we delve into the key takeaways from David Morgan's analysis, exploring the dynamics that shape the silver market and its potential implications for the future. David Morgan highlights the significance of direct relationships between silver miners and industrial users, bypassing intermediaries to access silver directly from refineries. This streamlined approach ensures a steady supply of silver for industrial applications, but it also reveals a crucial indicator of market dynamics. When demand outstrips supply from refineries, industrial users must turn to above-ground stockpiles to meet their needs. This depletion of stockpiles signals not only a deficit in the market, but also the potential for a shortage, prompting questions about the sustainability of current supply levels. Central to the functioning of the silver market are the contractual agreements between refiners and industrial users. These contracts often involve pricing mechanisms based on average spot prices over specific periods, providing stability for both parties while accommodating fluctuations in market prices. Moreover, David Morgan highlights the role of futures markets in hedging against price volatility, allowing industrial users to lock in favorable prices for future silver deliveries However, he also cautions that while hedging strategies may appear sound in theory, they can encounter limitations in practice, particularly during periods of market stress or sudden spikes in demand. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. They do have an agreement, offtake agreement with a main uh, silver user that rather than fiddy dally around with somebody, they just go direct to the mine. And they take it straight out of a Venus, you know, stockpile and use it. And that's probably done in, uh, I'm sure it's done in other places. I don't know how many, uh, not very many. I know that, but, um, it's probably more subtle than being in the contract base of, uh, you know, what dis what's disclosed by a Vino. But for the most part, no, they have direct relationship with the refiner. So XYZ Silver Mine, be it Pan American, be it Fresneo, be it um, any of the other primary silver or byproduct miners that, that produce a lot of silver, goes to the refiner and the industrial user buys it straight off of the refiner. And that's why when you see it deplete off of the COMEX or the ETFs or the LBMA, that's a big flag that, geez, they're not getting enough out of the refining industry. They have to go to above ground stockpiles in order to meet the demand. And that's a flag saying, wait a minute, we're starting to, it looks like at least, we're starting to deplete the above ground stockpile to meet the demand. And that, is that a shortage? It's definitely a deficit. It does say that there's not enough demand on an annual, there's more demand on an annual basis than there is supply on an annual basis. And that demand has to be met by above ground stockpiles, which implies the above ground stockpiles are being depleted again. The contracts are pretty interesting. Um, they vary. I haven't seen any, I've had some described to me. So like in the, uh, I, if you know, you could probably look up, I don't know what it is, but for example, a lot of these uh, contracts will be, we will pay you the average spot price over the last quarter. So they're not getting a high, you're not getting a low. So the average quarterly price for silver, let's say between April, May, and June 
let's pick a high number, like $28 is the average price. That's what these refiners will pay because they want to have the silver. They're price sensitive somewhat, as I explained earlier, for the most part, they're price insensitive. I mean, they want to get it for a good price, but they also want to get it. It's getting it's more important than getting every last penny out of, you know, the cost. So they will just do like a monthly, depends how the, what their delivery schedule is. It could be on a weekly basis. Depends what the user is and what their demands are and what the flow rate is. But it'll be a smooth curve so that both the refiner and the uh, end user is happy that they're both making, you know, a good deal for each other. I'm getting the price on an average for this month and you're paying the price on average for this month. Now, the way they manipulate or well let me restate that the way that they can um mitigate their cost is to go into the futures market and head say so well silver you know our analyst said that silver is a really good buy here at you know 25 so we're going to lock in our need for the next quarter silver at 25 and they actually pay 28 because silver did really well that quarter, well, they saved that $3 difference because they hedged in the futures market. And that happens all the time as well. But the problem is it works great on paper, but you know you can't put a piece of paper through the factory to produce a solar panel. So you know, there could be a time when that hedge fund that has 20 million ounces of silver and the manufacturer of solar panels gets desperate and says, Hey, we're not getting uh, the amount of silver we need. Silver is at 28. Uh, if we give you 30, will you take it? And the manager might say, yeah, we'll, we'll take 30. We'll take the $2 premium. How much do you want? Or we want, you know, 5 million ounces. So we take it on. So all these, some of that's theoretical, some of it's not. Uh, but yet you see where we could go with a, let's call it an industrial squeeze on the market coupled with a, financial squeeze on the market where if they combine, it could really shoot the silver price to new levels pretty easily, actually. It'll be like any market. There'll be um, spots where you can and spots where you can't. Uh, your big, big dealers will probably always have some inventory, but it'll get more and more exclusive, meaning uh, I want to buy this amount. Well, I could give you this much now. You have to wait for the rest. Well, I want to buy it now. Well, we've got these rare coins. I mean, it will be spotty. Um, as far as, this, you know, the retail market, it could dry up pretty fast, but it's price dependent too. I mean, there's a lot of people that paid huge premiums that are waiting to get out of their silver position or lighten it up because they bought too much at the wrong time. Uh, silver Eagles are a pretty good example, but uh, we could see once that gets worked through, which again, it could happen fairly quickly in a hot market. Then, uh, then we're on our way because now everybody's sitting at, you know, $33 silver and they're at least, you know, break even with their silver eagles and everything else they own is at a profit. And the profit's just beginning because their average price is $29 an ounce, you know, full price. They bought it at 26 and paid a $3 premium or they bought it at 25 and had a $4 premium. So now they're break even. So they're not going to sell. And now silver's tighter because there's, the retail guys are not going to sell. And the wholesale market's been bought off. And all of a sudden, as I've said once before, I said this quite some time ago. I think Rick Rule said something similar. and Maybe he took it from me. Maybe not. It doesn't matter. But there'll be a lot more silver bought above $30 an ounce U.S. than it was below 30 People buy markets that move. People buy higher prices. And that's how all commodities and stocks really move. Because when you get a new high, people, if everyone owns it at a new high and they're in the profit zone, they tend not to sell. They tend to hold. And when they hold on to it, that means any new buying pressure, be it just a small amount, bids the price higher. So you get a new, new high. So everybody that's holding still holds because it's a new, new high. How much higher is it going to go? There will always be an ebb and flow. I mean, there'll be people that will sell back at any price because they need it. They need the cash or 
they're sick of the market or their wife's nagging them or fund is moving into biotech and leaving the commodities market or whatever. So there are, it's always a two-way market, but it can be very, very tough to get new sellers into a market as a market's making a new high. And silver's especially noted for that as we witnessed back in the 2011 market between like March 1st and the end of April, early May 2011, we got a pretty good run up. And that was mostly paper driven at that point. So as we are seeing now, really, I saw something similar in the end of 79 in the 1980, you know, I mean, we had the my mys, you know, my my silver keeps going higher, my my silver keeps going higher, my my what's going on in the silver market. Oh my goodness, something's wrong with the silver market. What's happening? And we saw that to a lesser degree in the 2011 spike. But same situation, like, what's going on? How come it keeps going up? You know, I mean, people talk about manipulation a lot, and I certainly have. I wrote about it in the Silver Manifesto. But um, markets do move both ways. And whether it's being manipulated or not, you could argue one way or the other. But... Uh, the point being is that when you start to make a new high and everyone's holding, any buying pressure really will move the market. David Morgan offers insights into the intricacies of market dynamics and price movements, emphasizing the role of investor behavior in shaping silver prices. He observes that markets exhibit a tendency to rally as they approach new highs, fueled by investor optimism and reluctance to sell at perceived peaks. Drawing parallels to historical price spikes in the silver market, he warns of the challenges in identifying market tops with precision, but remains optimistic about silver's long-term prospects. And then you get to, well, where's the top? And that's always a tough one. I happen to call the top all the way up so far. Whether I'll do it again or not remains to be determined. I plan to like filter out, but I don't think 50 is going to be the top this time. It could be a temporary top. We could see somewhere around the $50 level and it sells off. It sells off hard, maybe it goes to 50, 51, 87, and then drops to 42, 20. And people get disgusted because that all took place in a matter of three trading weeks or something. So, oh my goodness, I should have sold at 50. I knew better, blah, 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 thinking that that's the top. And then it consolidates in the low 40s or something and then moves back up and all of a sudden it breaks through 50 for the first time and stays there. And then it continues to move up. So a lot going on, a lot to be optimistic about. Even Phillips Baker that was interviewed by Matt Watson on Kitco a while back. I know I'm hopefully not allowed to say that on, on your channel, but he talked about $100 silver. I mean, you don't hear a CEO of a major silver miner that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange talk about $100 silver and that consider him to be a crackpot. He's not, obviously. So I think we have a lot to look forward to. Is it going to be a Bitcoin move? No. Is it going to be, um, you know, some of these other cryptos? No. Is it going to be NVIDIA? No. But we take silver seriously as a monetary metal, the investor side does, and as, a, as the ultimate hedge, because if everything else is going down and silver is going up, um, it may be the last man standing in some portfolios. So it's worth having some. I think the biggest problem with most silver investors that are discouraged is buying too much, buying the wrong type and buying at the wrong time. Beyond its industrial applications, David Morgan discusses the evolving role of silver as a monetary asset and a hedge against currency depreciation. He highlights initiatives in certain US states to allow silver and gold to be used in transactions, paving the way for broader acceptance of precious metals in commerce. Furthermore, he envisions innovative solutions such as silver-backed digital currencies or debit cards, which could facilitate the seamless integration of silver into everyday transactions, mitigating the complexities associated with physical bullion. Well, digital form is taking place now. It's certainly not a big adoption to it, but there's some that have do it and use it. Um, as far as in physical form, uh, yes. I mean, there's, and I'm going to do a podcast here. In fact, I've got to get going on it. I've been promising it for a few months. But there's been several states here in the United States that allow silver to be, silver or gold and or gold to be used in any transaction as long as both parties agree. So that's already 
uh, on the books and legal? So the answer is yes. And I think what's really makes the impetus take place is further depreciation of the currencies worldwide and ease of use. And really the ease of use is to put silver in a depository and issue a debit card against it and or put silver in a depository and issue a digital cryptocurrency behind it. And with those two ways to implement it, it uh, makes it mitigates the problem of putting the silver eagle on the counter and saying, I want to buy this, you know, these two books or whatever. Uh, because then what do you do? <clears throat> what price do you use? Um, what do you give change in? And all that. All that circumvented if you just back it with silver and let, you know, the terms and conditions work, which you get the close of the LBMA at that evening as your standard price. And you are paid back in the fiat equivalent. Um, and, you know, away you go. Or, or you actually don't even get change. You basically just mitigate in grams or grains the exact amount of silver to fiat equivalent based on the LBMH uh, fix, and everybody's happy. And there's nothing wrong with doing it that way because the price of silver does move up and down, but so is the price of the dollar vis a vis the currency exchange rate. No one really thinks about that. They just think I'm spending dollars. But in a way, it does vary as well. So it would work quite easily. In fact, there are some systems that are set up, as I said earlier, but they're not well known and they're not taken advantage of. But as things deteriorate more, you'll see more and more people run to the gold and silver markets and they will start to take on these more, let's say, um, useful tools to be able to actually spend it.